I've never really developed the knack to know what to say on the last night of a gospel meeting. I, goodbye is not good enough to say, and see you later is hopeful but not certain. I guess all I can say is I appreciate you letting me come, and I'm glad we all lived long enough to live through it. I've talked with the elders shortly uh, before services, and hopefully I'll be able to return in the fall of 25. I'm looking forward to that already, and I'll practice with my new gun, my new single-shot shotgun, so I'll, uh, don't worry, I won't aim it at any of you. I'll see if I can get a squirrel or, or two, but it's just good to be here. I can tell you that coming here is like coming home. It's just been so many years, so many times throughout those years that we've been together, and you're always so kind and complimentary and, and thoughtful, and, and I appreciate it very, very much, and so glad that I've had this opportunity to be with you. I hope the lessons have been beneficial. When you go through uh, and choose the lessons you're going to use for a gospel meeting, you don't really know how well they might fit the circumstances where you're going or how needful those particular topics might be. But uh, if it's true to the word, they're needed, period. And I hope that I've been able to accomplish that and help you to understand God's will a little better for your life and to appreciate him a little more for all that he does for you. Tonight I want to talk for a little bit about heaven. In particular, why I want to go to heaven. Several years ago I was preparing a sermon on heaven. Uh, this has been probably 35 years or so ago. Uh, I was preparing uh, a sermon or two on heaven and I got to thinking, Sam, you're going to talk to these people for four or five Sundays about heaven. You're going to talk about getting to go there, what can keep you out of there. What about you, Sam? Why do you want to go to heaven? I think preachers need to stop and ask themselves every once in a while what they get out of their preaching because it's important for us to kind of know our topic and, and, and focus on our topic so that we can present it in a way that will be more easily acceptable and more easily understood. And so I just sat down and I made a list of the reasons I want to go to heaven. That list grows every year. I keep this particular outline on my desk constantly. And every once in a while I'll I'll get to thinking or I'll be reading a scripture or talking with a preacher friend and, and something will be said and I'll think, I need to write that down. I want to go to heaven. And I suspect you wouldn't be here if you didn't want to. You're here because you want to go to heaven. Now, it's not always that simple. I'll have to admit to you that when I was baptized at the tender age of almost 12 years of age, I was baptized because I didn't want to go to hell. And I suspect there's more in this building tonight than just me who felt that way. But through the years, my motives for, for being a Christian have changed drastically. It's gone from fear of being lost to appreciation to God for a saving me through his son. And I want to go to heaven. The passage that I had Brent read just a few moments ago from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is an interesting passage. If you look at it closely, you kind of get some insights into how Paul felt about heaven. It's believed by many, and there are fairly reliable traditions, that Paul was a very good competitive athlete when he was young. And if you can use his illustrations when he writes as any guide to that, he must have loved sports. In this particular passage that Brent lived, he talks about racing and he talks about boxing. He's described as a very small man, 
about four foot nine to five foot one inches tall, according to those who knew him back in that time frame. He had very dark hair. He had kind of a hawkish nose and narrow eyes that met with a unibrow right over top. The, these, are, these aren't take it to the bank descriptions, but they are based on very reliable trend, uh, tradition. And they said that his legs were terribly bowed because a lot of the sports he participated in it involved a lot of jumping and leaping and that Paul's legs became very bowed over the years in doing that. Now, how much of that's true, I don't know, but he sure used athletics a lot in his, pre in his writing. And if you look very closely at 1 Corinthians 9, Paul begins by reminding us that it's sort of a standard rule of racing uh, or running that only one person can win. And it's interesting that he would say that because in other places he, he talks about all of us winning. But in this particular case, he talks about this competition and he says, I want you to live like only one person can go to heaven and I want it to be me. Now that is not to make us feel snobbish, that's to challenge us to make going to heaven the priority of our lives, to, if you please, train for it like athletes train for their events, to put in your energy and your focus until you get to be as good as you can be in that particular competition. Now, it's not so that only one of us can win. We all can win through the blood of Jesus. But Paul said, I wish you would live so that only you could win. If you want to go to heaven, you've got to make it the priority. If you want to go to heaven, it's got to come before a lot of things that we've put first place ribbons on. He goes on to say that when he boxes, he doesn't just swing at the air. He practiced his movements. He practiced his style. He practiced it so that he could, if need be, win, win a, a bout or, or maybe even protect himself. But he said he did all of that so that he would not be a castaway while reaching out and trying to save other people. Did Paul want to go to heaven he wanted to go to heaven so much that in some ways he lived like only he would get to go. He wanted to be the person, the one person that could go. Now understand I'm talking figuratively, and Paul was too. But Paul basically says in 1 Corinthians 9 verses 24 through 27, Run the race like only one person can win it. And you want to be that person. If we all do that, we'll all be winners. We'll all be victors. I preach under the assumption, right or wrong, that those who come to listen to preaching want to go to heaven. And I want to share with you briefly three reasons why I'm in that group, why I want to go to heaven. Number one, because God wants me to. Like most Christians, my road to heaven has been up and down. There are a whole lot of things that I would go back to the little town of hundred and change if I could go back and change them because they wouldn't put me in a very good light. There are things that I've done that when I was doing them, I knew it wasn't right. Like most, my road to heaven's been pretty bumpy. I've won some battles, and I've lost some others. I think I'm closer to heaven than I've ever been before but I'm further than I wish I were. 
I'm traveling home. And I want to get there because God wants me to be there. I tell folks at times when I'm preaching on Christian influence, you know, folks, there are some days when I spend the day looking a whole lot like Jesus. Now, I don't know what he looked like physically. Men of that day were usually closer to five foot than six foot. Uh, you know, most of them wore the same kind of basic garments. Uh, possibly had a little bit longer hair than we would be healthy or happy with. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly how he looked physically, but I know how he was spiritually, because I can read that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I can see hints further of that in the epistles as they talk about Jesus being our example in his humility, being our example in his willingness to suffer, being our example in this way or that way. And when I read those things, I realize that sounds like me today. I look a lot like Jesus some days. But I'll also have to admit that I don't look very much like Jesus at all some days. There are days when, as we used to say back home, we got out up on the wrong side of the bed. We were, uh, there have been days when it just wasn't right from the, from the get-go. Now, you can joke about a lot of that stuff because I stopped to pick up a paper today and dropped change all over the place. I looked at the lady and said, I think I'm going to go back to the farm and go to bed. But there are days when things just don't come together. They don't work out. And there are also days for Christians when we just don't look very much like Jesus. What we do is not what he would do. What we are trying to be that day is not what he wanted us to try to be. We know that Christian means belonging to Christ or Christ-likeness. But it's so hard so often to look enough like Jesus that people notice. But in spite of all of that, God wants me to go to heaven. How do you know that, Sam? 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says that the very reason there is to not eat is because God is long-suffering or patient with us, not willing that we should perish, but that we should come to repentance. We have enjoyed a day that God gave us in hopes that this was the day we would choose to go to heaven. We would choose to obey the gospel, become a Christian, and have the hope of heaven in our hearts. In John 3 and verse 16, we read that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Paul will comment in one of his epistles that the love of Christ is, passes all knowledge, I think I know some of what he means by that. I love Leanne. I love Judy. I love Richard. I love him enough to die for him if it were called upon to do so. If the doctor called me and said, Sam, Leanne will never live a week unless someone can give her a heart, I would be the first in line to see if mine would fit her. I love my children. God gave his son because he loves me. Any way you want to cut it, God wants us to go to heaven. That's what he's wanted all along. And I've disappointed him enough in this life. I've had more than enough days when I didn't look enough like it. I've had more than enough days when the challenges were too strong for my faith. It's about time I made sure that God was getting his way with me. That God was trying to get me to be who he wants me to be. To try to please him in every way. I want to go to heaven because I've disappointed God enough. I want to go to heaven 
so God can be happy with the choices I make. But secondly, I want to go to heaven because of what won't be there. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4, we read, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. In 1 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4, Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively or living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. Now I know all about scripture's descriptions of heaven. I've read and studied about the streets of gold and the gates of purple. I've read of crystal seas and starry crowns. But I have to be honest with you, those things are not easy for me to grasp. I never made the kind of money that allowed me to own gold that allowed me to buy pearls. I never had the kind of income that allowed me to to sit myself down in the lap of luxury and drink in all of the beauty this world has to offer, all of the wealth and riches this world can provide. I just never have seen those things. I've never held those things, touched those things. So they're no real big deal to me. I am much more impressed when the Bible talks about what won't be in heaven than when it talks about gates of pearl and streets of gold. There will be no death, Revelation 21, 4 says, in heaven. In the years of my preaching, I have conducted 427 funerals. I've attended countless more. Too much death. Too much separation. But not in heaven. You won't need undertakers and mortuaries and cemeteries in heaven. I'm promised that it will be a place with no more death. Not only that, but it will be a place of no more sorrow. Boy, we can get our hearts broken. Broken right in two. Sometimes we just hurt almost beyond our capacity to bear it. There are times when events affect not us necessarily, but people we care for. I imagine there's more than one or two members of the, of the Sandyville congregation that almost come to tears when they begin to pray about all of the brothers and sisters here who are dealing with cancer, who are dealing with very serious illnesses. We're surrounded by sorrow. But not in heaven. I'm promised there will be no sorrow there. No second guessing, no wishing I'd have chosen differently, no sorrow at all, no crying. Most of us have to learn how to cry. And when we learn how to cry, we discover how bad it was that we didn't learn to cry sooner. The most cathartic thing that you can do for yourself when you're hurting or someone you love is hurting or something's happening in your life that's tearing you apart is shed tears. It's one of those things that kind of eases the internal pressure and and gives us an opportunity to, to flush out our eyes and our sorrow with tears so that we can be about the business of trying to help others do the same. When I have a funeral, the first thing that I always talk about when I use the theme, why we are here, is I say we are here to mourn a loss. 
And we don't have to be embarrassed by that. We don't have to be ashamed of that. We don't have to listen to someone say big boys don't cry or big girls don't cry. We have God's permission to cry down here. Even Jesus did. We talked about that earlier this week. But there won't be any tears in heaven. No crying up there. Nothing to break our hearts and move us to tears. No decision a loved one makes that tears our heart and life apart and moves us to tears. Not in heaven. Gates of pearl are probably beautiful things. Streets of gold would take your breath away. But how much better not having to face death. How much better not to have to deal with sorrow or crying or pain. Most of us whose hair looks a little closer to mine than it did to them years ago probably know a whole lot about Arthur. If you don't know Arthur, let me tell you a little bit about it. He's a social butterfly. He'll show up in every home in this church. Even though you would like to lock the door and keep him out. He'll hide in this joint in your thumb. He'll hide in the knuckle on this finger. He'll hide over here in this part of your palm. He'll hide in your knees. He'll hide in your shoulders. I'll be honest with you, if it weren't for Arthur, I think I would be just about as healthy as I was when I was still in high school. But it ain't without Arthur. Old Arthur and that Itis family, they're tough on us. Not many of us are going to escape it. The doctor may say, there's nothing more we can do. You're just going to have to learn to live with the pain. But not in heaven. You won't have to wake up in the morning and go like that to try to get your hands and fingers to move. You won't start to pick something up and find a muscle you forgot you had. Not in heaven. There won't be any pain there. Won't need hospitals, won't need emergency rooms, won't need doctors and nurses. We'll be in heaven. And I want to go where there's nothing that happens that we would call death or pain or sorrow or suffering. But I would also like, borrowing from Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and following, I'd like to borrow from Peter his life view. He says, folks, we've been given a lively or living hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. I don't know how much time I've got left. I'm, I'll be 72 in November. My little sister says, Sam, you're already living on borrowed time. And I tell her that my borrowed time is, uh, is precious to me, so just leave me alone about it. But at any rate, I love life. Love it deeply. But I love it more because I know that one day I'm going to be somewhere else that puts this place to shame. I'm one of these days going to be able to see hope become home. And what it will be like. Peter says there will be no corruption. Corruption means subject to death and decay. That's pretty adept uh, definition for it. Corrupted, if you're not talking about moral corruption, but just talking about physical corruption, which Peter was. It just means not subject to death and decay. The little hometown I grew up in doesn't sit very far, really, from Pittsburgh. 
We live, 100 is about six miles from the Pennsylvania state line. And if you take that, that road through 100 that goes up into uh, Pennsylvania and on toward Pittsburgh, you'll be amazed at how quickly you get there. It, it just surprises you. But every once in a while, someone will say, Sam, how far is it from 100 to Pittsburgh? I just kind of smile at him and say, oh, about eight dead deer. You measure distance on that road by how many deer have been killed and left laying there. And if they're left laying there enough, you'll understand death and decay. You'll understand why it's going to be so nice in heaven because there's nothing that can be corrupted there. There's nothing there that can hint at death or decay. We won't have to look over our shoulders at death. There's no corruption in heaven. We'll have spiritual bodies of some type that will fit us to enjoy everything God has planned and waiting for us in heaven. And we'll never die and leave it behind. We'll never die and just rot away, losing out on the blessings of God. But he also says that it's not only a place without corruption, but he says it's a place that's undefiled. To defile something means to make it dirty, to make it less, to do something that, that kind of ruins it. I'm glad that preachers don't have to wear neckties all the time anymore. I have, sorry about that, Kyle. I'll, I'm working on you, I just, but I'm working on Steve Stevens too. So, But uh, I, I'm just glad you don't have to. Someone asked me one time, said, Sam, you are so friendly. Do you ever get mad? And I said, well... I would like every once in a while to get my hands around the throat of whoever decided a necktie was dressed up. I don't like to wear them. I've got some at home that I think I'll just give for somebody to make a cushion cover for me or something. I, I'm about done wearing suits and ties. But there's another reason I don't like to wear a tie in addition to it being uncomfortable for me. Everything I eat goes home on it. You can tell what the menu was by looking at my tie when I get to the house. I don't know how many times I've defiled through the years, but it's been a bunch of them. But you know, there's nothing that exists that can dirty heaven. There's nothing that exists that can ruin heaven. There's nothing we ever have to deal with that's going to make heaven subject to ugliness, to, to shamefulness, or to just simply getting something dirty or ruined. Nothing at all. We are going to a place that's incorruptible, that's undefiled, and Peter says that fades not away. That means either of two things. One of the possibilities it is that it means that the promises of God will go on forever and ever and ever. But that's the very last part of the sermon, so I'm going to kind of park that there and leave it. The other possible meaning for it is that it'll never grow old. That you'll never get tired of it. We get tired of almost everything. Buy a new car. You'll think of more excuses to drive around town with a new car than, than you probably had put mileage on your old car in the last two months. We want people to see our new car. We want people to see how pretty it is, the color of paint it is, all of that sort of stuff that's important to car owners. But you know, within a few weeks and a little dent or scratch or two, you probably keep it up, but you keep it up not so much because you're still in love with it, but because you've got a payment book that thick and you know you've got to make them. 
Earth is a place where things fade away. I love the Statler brothers. I cried like a baby when Lou DeWitt died. I can't explain that to you. I can just tell you I did. And I shed a few tears when Harold Reed passed away. I love the Statler brothers. They were decent men. All four of them were elders in the Presbyterian church in the little town they lived. They were, they were good and godly men. They were well loved in, the, in uh, the, the little community they grew up in. But in addition to all of that, you just, I never got tired of hearing them sing. They were tremendous entertainers. They could put together beautiful harmonies. Now, they weren't the only group. I, I enjoyed a couple songs that the Oak Ridge Boys sang. I enjoyed a couple songs Alabama sang. But I loved the Statler Brothers. You know what my grandchildren say when I talk about the Statler Brothers? Who? Who? Who's the Statler brothers? We get tired of things. My favorite rock and roll group growing up was Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. I think I could sing every song they ever recorded, frontwards, backwards, and from anywhere in the middle in either direction. I love Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. There were some other groups. I liked Herman's Hermits. I liked... Uh, uh, a couple or three others that, that were pretty good. Never cared a whole lot for the Beatles, never cared a whole lot for the Beach Boys. But I, I love Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. How that guy kept from popping a gut string when he would go that high, I, I don't know. But you know what my kids say when I talk about Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons? Who's that? Clothes styles change. Automobile designs change. Everything in this world changes. It's temporary. And sometimes those changes come and are pulled off without a hitch. And other times people long and long and long, year after year after year, to get something close to it to come back. But it won't be that way in heaven. When you get to heaven, nothing will fade away. Nothing will lose its beauty. Nothing will lose its glory. It'll be as beautiful 10 billion years into eternity as it was when it took your breath away the first time you saw it. That's why I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven because God wants me to go. And I don't want to disappoint him. And I want to go to heaven because of what's not going to be there. The other things are, are wonderful. But what's not going to be there touches me more than what will be. But finally, I want to go to heaven because there's nothing temporary about it. Things change so quickly. Those who grew up in the 50s can hardly believe our nation today. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail for it, but I tell you what, the preacher's right, who one time said, if God doesn't bring judgment on America pretty soon, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Our world is going to be falling apart. Our society is crumbling at our feet. Nobody respects authority. People seem to be focused primarily, if not completely, upon themselves instead of anyone else. We're, we're living in a mess. I have my opinions about some things we could do to uh, change a few of those back into the direction they ought to be going. But folks, things down here are temporary. And just when you start learning to appreciate something, sometimes sickness or death takes it away from you. Just when the moment comes that you're beginning to see the beauty of something God has made, your eyes close in death. It, it's a temporary world. 
But you know the two words that describe eternity more than any others? Eternal and everlasting. They both mean exactly the same. Forever. All of the things that won't be there will never be there. All of the good and beautiful things that God wants me to enjoy will always be there. Because heaven will always be there. And God upon his throne will always be there. And the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world will be there always. The saints will be there forever and ever and ever. Picture it any way you need to picture it for heaven to be more real and, and more realistic to you. And just remember that when you develop the most beautiful image you can think of, the real beauty of heaven will put it to shame. And since nothing can spoil it, since nothing can take away its beauty, it's an always thing. And I want to go to heaven because I'm tired of change. Especially tired of changing in the direction we're going in. I want to go to a place where you are respected for going to church, not laughed at. I want to go to a place where I can be in touch with God constantly whether others have any time for him or not. I want to go to God or heaven because it's a forever thing. Do you want to go to heaven? I haven't told you how you can get there yet. I've just told you about what to expect when you do. So let me take a moment as we close this sermon to tell you that Jesus taught he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's good enough for me. When Jesus summarized it, that became my marching orders. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's how you get to heaven. If you are a believer, one who holds the conviction that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you're willing to be buried with him in baptism for the remission of your sins, you become a child of God, an heir of everything God has to give his children, and an eternal home that Jesus is coming back someday to take you to. Why put it off? Why trade the temporary for the eternal and vice versa? Become a Christian tonight. We'll see that you're baptized scripturally. God will take care of the rest. If you'd like to do that, we're going to sing an invitation hymn. As we sing that hymn, if you would just make your way to the front, Kyle will be here to receive you and talk with you briefly, and we can take care of your soul's sin problem this very evening. If you need to come, we hope you'll come now while we stand and while we sing.